turn your Android tablet into a fully programmable MIDI controller for your DAW for less than $20? That's got to be worth a look. So a few weeks ago, Manos from Development in Greece reached out to me and asked me if I'd like to take a look at their Android app, Doit. This is a DAW controller running on an Android device. So I said yes. They've sent me a copy of the software, but they're not paying me to make this video. So the views are my own. I'm not going to give you a how to. There are videos on the development YouTube channel that will walk you through the basics. What I am going to do is have a look at how I've configured it and how I can use it with the software that I've got. Although I'm demonstrating it in Cubase, it will work as a generic MIDI editor with any DAW, so I'm told. So the first thing to do is to have a look at how you connect it to your computer. I'm using a standard USB cable running through a hub into my laptop. The first thing you have to do is to set it so that it actually works as a remote MIDI device over USB. Now, when I bring it up, it comes up as USB for file transfer. So I can tap for other options and that gives me MIDI. And once I've connected that, I can then launch do it. It's a nice funky little sound. The first thing to do is to go in and select the MIDI port. Now it doesn't remember the MIDI port, so every time I connect I have to reconnect it. And then we're ready to start. But as with all things, you have to have this up and running and connected to your computer before you launch your DAW. So I'll now launch Cubase. OK, so we're now set up in Cubase and I've connected Doit as a remote controller. Let's have a look at some of the features. The first thing you can see on the home screen is that there are a row of buttons at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is if I select the faders, you can set up these faders so that they each work with a different controller on a MIDI channel. Now, in order to keep track of what's going on, I've actually created an Excel spreadsheet. In the setup guide on their website, they recommend using MIDI channels three and four. I'm not sure that's such a good idea, as you could end up using channels three and four if you're, for example, using a multi in contact. So I've set mine up on channel 15 and channel 16, but I do have some things set up on channel one because for the most part, when you're working in your DAW, you will be working on MIDI channel one. You would have to change this in DOIT if you decided to use a different MIDI channel for any particular instrument. So what I've set up in DOIT is a series of faders that are specific in part to Cubase. We've got the channel volume. So if I have the audio fader, I can do that. And you can see in real time as I move that up and down, the audio fader moves. I will open up BBC Orchestra. And what we have here, I have set up faders for expression, dynamics, and for the reverb. So if I just pop my headphones on, and I simply play something, You can see that I've got control of those using just the touch screen on the tablet. You can allocate these. The vibrato, for example, 
hasn't got MIDI controller preset. So you could allocate this to a different controller than the 19, which it's set to at the moment, and then learn the MIDI CC automation simply by moving the fader. One of the things we have in Cubase is quick controls, where you can allocate from either a VST instrument and or uh, VST plugins um, some of the controls. And what I've done here is I've set up the quick controls on faders. So I can, for example, control the expression and dynamics also from here and the, the other parameters that you can see on screen. Where this comes in useful is if you have, for example, audio inserts, say you've got a compressor on there, let's put one of the standard Steinberg ones on. You can allocate that to quick controls to say slot three. We now go back to our quick controls and the release on the VST plugin is now allocated to that. So although by default you can click to import the quick controls from your instrument, you can actually overwrite that with your own custom set, which you can then record in real time. The other thing I've got is I have automated the sends. And if I actually had sends set up on this, then I could control the amount that I was sending to each of the sends using the faders. I've only bothered to set up sends one to four because I very rarely use more than four sends on any individual track. You can see how I'm moving the faders along by running my fingers on this gold line at the bottom but if I put my finger on the faders button, I move across to the next button on the bottom bar, which is actually the XY controller. So I have set this up in three ways because there are three different types of XY controller. We'll start with the stray light, far light, and presumably ash light VSTs that are in uh, contact. They use different controllers. If we have a look at the master here, you can see that the X and Y axis are preset to MIDI controller 11 and MIDI controller 1. So we will come back to the perform tab. Now I have to be careful with this because stray light and far light do put some uh, strain on my computer but if I put my finger in the middle of the screen you see the little dot moves and then we can that crackling you can hear is because my computer's struggling to keep up I haven't altered the buffer settings you can see as I move up and down the modulation wheel is moving but as I go side to side, the modulation wheel doesn't move. So that's stray light and far light. The other one that uses a different combination is Mysteria and Thrill. And Again, you can see if I move that, if I just scroll across using that, I go in and I can just holding the keys down. I can use the XY controller. Now that one is set up for channel two and three on the X and Y axis. And the final one that I've got set up 
is one of the oldest VSTs I've got, which is the Korg Wave Station. And again, it has this vector control. All good fun. The next screen across is perhaps the most challenging one to set up. Just tap on it, being a bit gentle there. And that is the buttons. You can actually set up a whole raft of buttons. You can actually have four different sets of buttons. You can have four presets within your profile. So what I've gone for here is a left hand right hand system where my right hand is working either the keyboard or the mouse and my left hand is operating do it. So if we want to record what we do is we set up the pre-roll. So as you can see the pre-roll is now enabled. I will set the punch in and punch out. And then all I have to do on the selected track is hit play. Hang on a minute, you say. What happened to your nice sliders? Well, let's delete that. We can edit the VST. I'll open that up. And what I'm going to do is if I hold down this button, it actually brings up the faders and this red line at the bottom allows me to move between the faders. And these buttons here at the side allow me to move this around on screen, resize it, and we'll also jump to the start and the end. So when I'm mixing, for example, I can just go to the start and I have access to the volume fader for the channel, whereas if I just slide across right now, you'll see that I've got it set to two faders width and we can record using those sliders once we set going. So we'll enable punch in again. except it's not recording. Why is it not recording? Stop. It's not recording because I didn't return to the beginning when I set it going. So punch in and out. I've got the VST open so I could show you the everything moving. I can't see what I'm doing on screen. So let's try that again. So stop. Want to get rid of them? Just tap that again, hold it down again, and it disappears. So I can set back to zero. I can go to the right marker, the left marker. What I've got here is all the automation. So I can show the automation lanes and show recording lanes. Um, I can show automate. I've got one of these set up to show the automation. There is no automation because it's just the volume. So if we double click to edit that, you can see down here I've got the expression. You can also see that my timing was well off because I was deliberately ignoring the click. And what we will do is we will zoom in. Now, that gives me an opportunity to show you the quantize features. 
you can set up the I mean I've set up the various panels but here we can quantize this and as you can see it's bringing them in I've set these up to do all manner of things that you might expect these at the bottom the show hide next plugin were where you have audio inserts Let me open that once you've got it open it will show it and hide it you can also if you've got multiple plugins again we'll go to, uh, to Steinberg and bring a delay in you can jump back and forth between your two plugins and you can close them all you can open the mixer if you set it up that way and I do have all of the different functions set up as you can see I've got zooms quantize so you can program these and if you want to have a starting point if you go to the development forum you can actually download a model that Manos has created and by the time this video goes live you will also be able to download my setup as well so what do I think well I think the first thing you have to do is to place this in context hardware units which offer the same functionality but not necessarily the same level of integration cost in the order of 10 to 20 times what you would pay for this app it's available from the Google Play Store now for $17.99, €14.99 Euros or £12.99. A fraction of what you'd pay for some of the really nice silky smooth hardware units. OK, it's a touch screen. It's not got the smooth glide of a fader or the positive click of a button. And it doesn't always behave in the way you'd expect. It may be that I've had some issues because I'm trying to screen record at the same time as I'm trying to control Cubase with it. It's not behaved in the way that it's behaved during this recording when I've been setting it up. So I think there are some strains I'm putting on the system that it wouldn't normally have. There are some things that I would like to see better. I think the fader panels are a little bit wide, but overall, but it's the fact that you can get it to do most things that you want to do within your DAW that appeals to me. The one thing I couldn't get it to do was to freeze tracks in Cubase. But that's not a limitation of DOI. It's a limitation of the commands that are available within Cubase that you can set up to a generic MIDI controller. So all in all, I think it's something that I will value as an addition to my music making equipment. I'll certainly continue to use it and probably get more familiar with it and improve my use of it because at the end of the day what you get is a blank canvas you can import a preset profile that somebody else has done but the best thing to do ultimately is to think about what you want and to program it to work the way you want it to work and that is perhaps its strongest feature everybody who buys it has the opportunity to set it up to work the way they want to work, not the way that Doit says they should work. I appreciate it's been a bit of a rush. I've covered as much as I can and tried to keep it as tight and short as I can. I will perhaps come back to Doit in future videos, but I did want to get this initial look posted on YouTube so that people could have a think about it, have a look at it and make their own minds up. With all that said, I do hope you found this video of value. If you have, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. There's more to come. And so, as always, until next time, you take care of yourselves.
Well, that was a right shambles.